My name is Peggy Jones. As a school board member here in Indian River County, I'd like to welcome you to our MCAN Summit. Uh, we just have a few things be before we begin our agenda. And the first thing I'd like to do is introduce Dr. David Moore, our superintendent, who will be welcoming you. Thank you. Dr. Moore, come on up here. Thank you, Dr. Jones, and it is absolutely wonderful to have everyone here that's not on a computer screen looking at a little square. So it is so happy for this group to be back together. So give us a round of applause. I think I read it was February 2020 for this group to come together. So it is exciting to have us back here today uh, supporting our community, ultimately supporting our children. This is hard, hard work, but now is the time to do the work. And we as a school system are, are really aggressively trying to transform what education looks like, recreating, re-envisioning re what public education looks like. In some cases, trying to break all the rules to be in the best interest of children. And we're seeing significant results, new curriculum, new ways of planning, partnerships, uh, Learning Alliance throwing 13 coaches, how many, uh, instructional coaches into our schools to provide direct support to teachers each and every single day. Not once a month PD, but shoulder to shoulder with the teacher in the classroom, planning, debriefing, thinking, reflecting, and improving the quality of instruction. So you think back to our goal of uh, three and above by third grade, 90%. And prior to the pandemic, we were at 60. I know, right? Yeah, I feel like I'm good. Um, we celebrated as through that pandemic, uh, we were one of only 13, 12 districts in the state of Florida that didn't regress. We stayed at that 60 after what was probably the most difficult uh, year of education in the, uh, across the nation. And now halfway through the year, we're projecting over 60, 66, 67 with another three months to go. So we're seeing significant improvements. Yeah. That data is not complete yet. We're, we're, we're still going on, but to be uh, significantly further along than we were two years ago without the pandemic uh, is a reflection of the hard work of our teachers, of our staff, and ultimately us as a community. Uh, so this meeting is so important because it can help accelerate uh, what we want to do for kids. So I am so happy that we're back here live. Uh, we're engaged. We're going to invest, try to disconnect for the next couple hours and give 100% to our kids. Thank you uh, for being here and let's get to work. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moore. And before we begin, um, M. Can would like to recognize a couple people here at the district. Uh, this room is used quite a bit and it has to be set up sometimes within an hour and we always have to make sure it's in the right arrangement. And there are two people here that really, really help us with all that. And the first one we would like to reckon recognize is the amazing Peggy Poissell, Executive Director. <laughs> Now that she deserves this. <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll tell you. Peggy kept saying to me, why, why do I have to come down here? I said, Ms. Poissel, just please listen and come down here for just a moment. Uh, she and I go back many, many, many years. She's loyal, she's caring, she's passionate, and she is always there working for students, which we all do. So thank you very much, Ms. Poissel. Thank you. And the next person is uh, somebody who is called upon all the time to help us with arranging tables, making sure they're in the right area, that we have enough chairs. Javon Cummings, come on up here. We appreciate you. There you go, buddy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, he, he's from Sebastian River High School, so we know he's okay, right, buddy? Go Sharks. Okay, thank you, thank you. And before the agenda, we're just going to do something here. Again, as Dr. Moore said, it's great to see everybody in person. If you have been with MCAN, Moonshot Community Action Network, for 10 years since its beginning, please stand and stay standing if you've been here for 10 years. Okay. All right, all right. She's, you know, keep standing. No, no, no. Jeff, everybody, keep standing, keep standing. Now, if you have been here 
for the last five years, please stand. I'm, I'm with that group. Okay, keep going. Ten years, five years. Okay, all right. If you joined, let's say, right around the pandemic, 19, 20, 21, stand up now. Stand up now. Okay, pretty good, pretty good. All right. And all other guests, please stand up at this time. VIP guests, everybody. Okay, everybody give yourself a round of applause. All right, you may be seated. Thank you so much. Again, it's just so nice to see everybody and everybody's nice and smiling and you are here for students. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get going. So I think Ms. Arsenal, you're next. Yes, <laughs> looks like it here. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. Good morning, my name is Debbie Arsenault with the Learning Alliance and my role today is to get our brains jump started uh, by playing a little bit of a game because as research tells us, if we gamify learning, kids get more involved. Sometimes, spoiler alert, you could just tell them it's a game, but this is actually a game. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna play a game called Kahoot. All right, we got a little, we got a little dramatic music here. All right, the way this works is pretty straightforward. You're going to see four squares. Pick the one that matches the answer. All right, I made the first question a gimme. So let's see how it goes. Very dramatic. Dun -dun. All right, I'm gonna have to click it through. What is MCAN? All right. We have We have four choices. One. A recycling term. I either need more volume or more listening. <laughs> All right, there we go. I said A, a recycling term. B, an action network committed, or yellow, an action network committed to making IRC a ca literacy capital of the nation. Blue, a new species of toad. Green, a moonshot collection agency network. <laughs> I don't actually know what we're collecting, perhaps words. All right, so it is on both screens, whichever one you're closer to, and I will also read it. So you can look on that one or this one, and I will also read it. So great. That was our first question. That was the practice gimme. Five to four. Here we go. Let's see. If you were paying attention during the opening, you might have actually gotten a clue to the answer to this next question. <laughs> All right. Oh. Let's not forget, we must rank ourselves. All right, here we go. <laughs> here we go. If you want me to read them, get ready to listen. What year was MCAN, formerly the Literacy Leaders, started? 2005, 2014, 2011? 2015, 2005, 2014, 2011, 2015. Ooh. Eight people, eight groups answered correctly. 2011. Look at that, you moved that up. All right, they only get more, tr they get trickier from here. Here we go. National Pace Center Awards has MCAN received? Nine, five, three, one. Yeah, nine is the correct answer. And f <laughs> there's. <laughs> That's okay. We don't. We all we need to do is celebrate success. Here we go. And 
nine years, I just want y'all to take a moment to process that. Nine years this community has been acknowledged for being a pace setter at the national level in this work. That is all of you, whether you joined 10 years ago in 2011 or this year, and this is your first meeting. So you are all part of this celebration. Here we go. Oh, Wild Things is on fire! <laughs> all right, last to join, first in the leaderboard. Here we go. When does learning to read begin? Birth? Preschool, kindergarten, or once a child can talk. Wow, y'all knew that one quickity quick. All right. And we know that it's birth because of the social, emotional, and health components. We also know that learning to read starts to happen before school when we are read to. Right? That oral language is an es essential component, a foundation to being able to learn to read. That was a gimme, apparently. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Here we go. What did it do to our scoreboard? Oh, I mean, wild things still on fire, but stone soup coming up, coming up. All right, here we go. While IRC is poverty higher than the state average, how do our third grade literacy scores compare to the state? Better, worse, same. Wow, everybody knew that one. Fantastic. And I'm actually going to look at my notes for the numbers because not everybody has the numbers in their bones. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, but better than the state average. And as Dr. Moore spoke to, you know, we, we are holding firm in the face of a lot of challenges. So that is absolutely worth celebrating and gives us momentum to build upon. So let's keep that train going. Here we go. Do, 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 do. Stone soup, stone soup, stone soup. Holding. Overachievers coming in, coming in. All right, here we go. <laughs> Taking it over. All right. This is a numbers question. What is the return on investment in quality? Early childhood programming. $2 for every one. $4. $8. $13. Ooh. Interesting split. $8 or $13. Guess what? It is actually $13 for every $1 investment. And this is huge. And as this will be, as we talk about uh, everything we are actually doing today, a big part of that conversation is how are we able to do it, right? And that's a lot of that is flipping the script on this notion that this is an expense, but in fact, spending on early childhood programming is an investment, an investment in our future and an investment in our community. So $13 return for you numbers folks, grab it and run with it. Here we go, here we go. What did that do to our scoreboard? Oh, word collector. I like how everybody's moving along on a streak. This is good. All right, get ready. Seven of nine. In 2008, four of our 13 public elementary schools were Title I, meaning greater than 70% poverty schools. How many are Title I now? out of 13. Five, seven, nine, 13. 100%, the room was 100% correct. Nine of our 13 public elementary schools. And let's just pause and process that for a moment. Just over 10 years ago, only four of our 13 elementary schools were struggling with high levels of poverty. And we know that with that comes struggles in school and out of school. And we cannot tackle this challenge, this early literacy challenge, without acknowledging that is our reality and the challenges that come with that, right? So here we are looking at nine out of 13 of our public elementary schools with increased level of poverty and everything that comes with it. So thank goodness we are all in this together. All right, number Ooh, oh, wow, things inch and overachievers, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, here we go, here we go. I believe this is the second to last question. What are the downsides of low literacy in society? 85% of juveniles in the court system are functionally illiterate. Low literacy costs the US healthcare industry. Okay, everybody read them and answered. <laughs> yes, I'm gonna read them though, so that you all hear them. This, Marie, this is why we had to cut the character count. <laughs> 85% of juveniles in the court system are functionally illiterate. That means they cannot read enough to do everyday tasks, to get a job, to hold a job. 90% of high school dropouts are on welfare. And we know that students who are behind by the end of third grade, one in four will catch up. They are that much more likely to become a high school dropout and contribute to this statistic. And low literacy in the US costs the healthcare industry over $70 million a year. Think about what it means if you can't read the instructions on a bottle or a prescription, right? These are not small impacts and they add up. There's more, but I was only able to put three options. <laughs> so we know that this challenge is big, but low literacy, not just illiteracy, is part of the struggle. And thank goodness our friends at Literacy Services and others are also really tackling the adult low literacy problem. Here we are in the space to set up our young people so they don't become part of those statistics. Are we ready for our last question? All right, not a lot of movement. Let's see who's going to take it over. I should have made this last question worth extra points. Who belongs to the Moonshot Community Action Network? The school district, social service organizations, elected officials and community leaders. All of you is, in fact, the correct answer. All right, time for the final scores. players. You should be excited about that. I'm Heidi Sparks Goober. I've been a member of the MCAN community since it started and even before. I, I was around before even the declaration of the Moonshot Goal. And I have been watching and participating with you with love and pride for the last decade or more. And it is an apps. I haven't seen you, I haven't been with you in person for two years. And somehow during that time, some amazing things happened. People started to learn how to collaborate virtually. And, and as a result, I've been able to spread your story even more. Ever since I got involved with you, I've also been working with, uh, literally with communities around the world. I've told you through time about South Africa, about Southeast Asia, about now we're working with the uh, Sustainable Development Goals of the UN. And every single time I meet with these people, what comes up is you as an example. Now I know when you're working here that you don't realize the difference you make broader than being here. But I want you to know that for most communities in the world that I know, you are a living demonstration of what their vision is in the world, which is to have a community that is greater and the sum of its parts. So one thing we learned in the process of Moonshot, and you know, some of you I've known from the beginning, and a lot of you are new. One of the uh, learning, I, would, I was asked to talk about some of the things that we've learned in the process of Moonshot. One of the things that we've learned is that this great work has been going on for a long time. There are people in this room 
that have been doing this great work well before 2010. Well before, they've been doing, I know Judy's been doing this li literally for decades, right Judy? And there are other people in this room that have been doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I'm four decades, so. But, but what I want you to understand is that from outside looking in, that what is uniquely amazing about this community, and it's why you have nine Paysetter Awards uh, for the Big Tent, for being able to include everyone in the solution, the COVID response, it's why you have such an amazing superintendent now, is because you are greater than the sum of the parts. You have taken all the, there are lots of communities that have brilliant people working in them. It's very rare when people cross over the system and are able to start to share in a way that accelerates everybody's work. And so I just want you to know that you are unique and truly special in my experience of, of the communities that I work with, and you are a beacon of hope and light to many communities that you will never know. Now we have just uh, finished the draft of a, uh, a case, about 60, it's a brief case about this, what's happened in the last decade here. And you'll be able to read it soon. We're kind of going over the final details of it. And we hope it's the beginning of a series of stories. Because Moon, this, this MCAN, the Learning Alliance, Moonshot, are, are a fractal. What I mean by that is everybody in it is the whole story. Everyone in this movement is the center of the story. So we want to start telling the stories from, from points of view from all the different points of view of, of this uh, work. But in this case, the first thing we talk about is what happened 10 years ago when we did the first visioning sessions with the school district and with the community leaders. And what has happened since has come straight out of that visioning. So today we're gonna return to the process of visioning and you all are going to be building on that vision and what has happened since. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how that works. Um, so actually the today, the purpose of today is to be able to appreciate where we've come from since we set our vision 10, 11 years ago. It's to look at where we've come from. It's to look at what the current condition is. And then it's to create a vision of what it's going to look like in 2025. How, how will we, we're going to imagine ourselves in 2025 and we're going to be looking at what it looks like so that we can then ask how did we get there. And so at the beginning and during this meeting, we'll be talking about that vision. Each presenter, each story you hear that comes from the past will have in it current state, some of the innovations that have happened and some of the, the, the challenges that we're now meeting. And then we'll be looking at what it, it looks like in 2025, just like we did 10 years ago. And we're hoping that that case is the first of five years from now, or, or three years from now, that we're actually looking at what happened, and we're telling that story again. So the thing that's so remarkable about this group is that you are a learning community, which means that you never rest on what you've accomplished. Everything you accomplish actually becomes the platform for you to look ahead and see what's next. And, and you have the language, you have the processes to be able to do that. So that's part of today, is what we're doing, we're, we're taking that forward. So what we hope to do here is to move and inspire you with what's happened, to really get excited about what's happened, but then to also step back with the humility to say, and it's almost like we've just begun, so where do we go now, All right? So in the, um, I'm just going to tell you a couple things we've learned in the MCAN history or the Moonshot history, the, T the Indian River County, County history since we started. And that is that first, that the one of the first things we learned is that in dealing with systems-based issues, complex problems that could be not, not, cannot be solved easily by one or two people or, or organizations, that in systems-based problems, breakdowns are, the breakdowns lead to breakthroughs. Some of you have already heard that and you practice that well, it's so why you are where you are. That what you're doing when you run into something that doesn't work the way you want is you're running into the edges of the system that created that what used to be the solution but is now creating the problem. And so that's something that is embedded in, in all the work here. It's the beginning of learning. It's the beginning of the humility to learn. Another thing is, is, was the miracle of the formation of MCAM, the Moonshot Community Action Network. is actually a miracle. I mean, it came out of the vision, 
But no one envisioned that there would be 70 or however many members you have now, people coming together from all parts of the community to learn together and to share what's working. This is, this is truly unusual. Uh, another thing is about um, this, the thing I said earlier about bringing together people who have been doing this work for a long time, and even people who are just being added, but the, but the aggregated effect, the emergent effect of being able to come together and learn across the system is something that, that we have found is absolutely essential to real progress. And you guys, you guys model it. Um, you have a shared learning discipline that gives you the language to actually talk about these things and work with them. The formation of, um, of the MCAN, uh, who are the, are there any MCAN fellows in the room? I know there are. But this idea of, of, of nominating and having leaders that are appointed and actually asked to be the leaders of this group, that's a miracle too. The nine pace setter awards, um, and the fact that, in, uh, that recently the Oak Foundation has named Indian River County as one of the four bright lights in the United States for, uh, for um, um, literacy, for being able to create programs that, that encourage literacy. So what is reverse visioning? How did this happen? Why is reverse visioning part of the approach that, that um, Indian River County uses? Reverse visioning, the purpose of a vision, a lot of people work with vision, and sometimes vision creates more cynicism than it creates possibility because people are used to declaring things and then not achieving them. So part of actually taking the risk to name a vision is to be willing to admit that you don't know how we're going to get there. It's what happened with the original moonshot. They did not know how they were going to achieve that in the next 10 years when President Kennedy said he was going to send, that we were going to send a man to the moon and bring him back safely. That was an important part of the vision. Uh, not too many people would get behind it if we didn't bring him back, right? <laughs> or didn't say that was part of the deal. Um, but it's very much the purpose of vision is to, is to create a taste for action. It's really profound when a group of people can come together and no matter what our differences are, and there's a lot of them now, but no matter what those differences are, that we can come together, create a vision around uh, of what it looks like when we've achieved our ideal state, because we all share certain things we care about, and one of them absolutely is the well-being and the and the, uh, the and the literacy of our children, and our and because they are indeed our future. So creating a vision means to be able to talk about what that would look like, so that we can actually sense, and this is the hard part, sense the gap between what we want to, but what we know we can be, how, what we know we can be, and where we are now. Jim Collins talks about great leaders being able to hold both the ideal state way out here and the brutal truth about the current state. And the current state is always, compared to the vision, is always a brutal truth. There's always a gap. And the biggest thing to understand is we don't know how to get there until we actually allow those two things to exist in our heart. When you hold those two things, you come up with what it takes. So that's what we're doing. And, and this time we're doing it a little differently. Ten years ago, what we did is we actually created it up on a big picture of what it, would, you know, what it would look like in ten years, and then we went back and what it would take. This time we have the benefit of what we've learned. We now have learned something. So <clears throat> you're going to have, in a, in a few minutes, you're going to have about, I think it's five stories that are going to be told to you. And each one of them is going to be holding the past, the present, and some ideas about the future state, the, the ideal state that we're going for in 2025. But we're going to have you participate, too. So you'll be hearing stories to get you started. But this is a, this is a collaborative event. So if you look, you sat down, if you're either sitting on or it's in right in front of you, you have a key takeaways page that while you're hearing these stories, as you're getting insights, questions, new, you'll, you'll be getting new information because we're learning new stuff all the time, say about brain development. You'll be hearing about this and its impact about on education and learning. So as you're listening to each of these stories, we want you to write down insights you're getting. Maybe the first time you've ever heard certain facts that actually touch you and make you want to want to do something. because. Vision leads to action. So you, we put that down, actions that you could take, and especially if you notice, those of you who are new, uh, MCAN 
participants are already deeply involved in seeing where they can play and how they can make a difference. If you've been added today, there's something that you bring to this community that's really, really important and special. And that is a, is, might be a missing piece in how we're, how we're going about this. So what we want you to do is be listening for where you, what you bring will make a difference. And write that down as a potential, just a thought, a potential action. So you'll be going through that. Um, you'll have those four or five stories and you'll be listing those things and then at the end, near the end of the session, by the end, we're going to have a design conversation where you get, where you get to actually look at those things and talk in small groups about some of the things we might be able to start getting going on now. What, what could you actually bring? And we're giving a, one, a typical of, of MCAN, I, I'm just pleased to say that, is that we'll also be giving you a way to activate that. So there's a, a campaign coming up. If you look on your tables, the faces, can't, these faces that you're seeing, this is a really special campaign that's being launched um, from January to April. Well, there, there will be an opportunity to, uh, to share the things you've learned today with lots of people. And MCAN typically will be doing the heavy lifting. Anything you want to share, anything you want to bring forward, any action you see that's possible, uh, there will be a way to make that active uh, today. You'll be able to ask for um, what, you, what be part of the vision. And we hope when we write that case five, four years from now, that you're in it, that you're a featured part of that. Uh, so that, let's see if there's anything else you need to know. Yeah, and we'll, we'll follow with the, these stories that you're about to hear with this discussion and this ability to state what you'd like to bring to the party. And uh, that's, that's where we're gonna start now. I'm about to introduce two people and they really mean a lot to me because in our original vision that we did back in 2011, 2012, well, Ray Oglethorpe has been part of this. If, it weren't, if he weren't part of it, we wouldn't be where we are today. And I think many of you know many details about that. But what I'm really moved by is that Ray was, was personally part of the, creating the vision from the very start. And while we were doing that vision, we, part of the vision was that within the decade, we would be attracting talent, world-class talent to this community that would make a huge difference. And so the other person who's gonna be up here with Ray is Dr. Moore, who for us is a living demonstration that vision works because he was a gleam in our eye, just like I'm sure we were a gleam in yours a long time ago, way before we met. And it was because of the vision that, that, that Dr. Moore, that we think, we think it's because of the vision that Dr. Moore is here. So I wanna bring you two guys up and they will start us with the first story. So remember, we need your insights and comments and, and actions that you wanna take that these stories inspire, okay? So Dr. Moore and Ray, Come on up. You want me to go with Dr. Moore? Okay, I'm I'm the past to the present here, so let me go through it. Uh, I'm Ray Oglethorpe. I'm the chairman of the Learning Alliance, and thanks for coming here and being with us this morning. Um, you know, education means the world to me. If you're looking for a poster child of how education transformed lives, I'm it. I was born in a coal mining town in southwestern Pennsylvania. If it hadn't been for education, I would still probably be in that coal mining town. I was fortunate in my life to have had great teachers who inspired me, who turned me on, who made me want to dream big dreams and helped me realize those dreams. It made all the difference in the world. And so when two mothers approached me uh, trying to change education here in Indian River County, I started doing some research. And the research that I came up with were three profound thoughts. And they've been with me and they drive me every day. They drive the Learning Alliance and they drive our school district every day. And the first one is that in K through three, you learn to read. Thereafter, you read to learn. And if you can't read, you can't learn and you can't earn. The second thing is if you can't read by the end of the third grade, you only have a one in six chance of ever catching up. 
And the profound, really shameful part is that across this United States, 65% of our third graders cannot read proficiently. 65% cannot. This is a national shame that a rich country like ours can have so many of its children failing so early in their lives. That's an absolute shame. So that got me going with the Learning Alliance and got my commitment to it, to try to change this horrible statistic. And as you heard earlier from Dr. Moore, we are making a big difference here in Indian River County. If I look back at what got us to where we are today, I think there's four things. The first thing is that we set this big, hairy, aggressive goal of 90% literacy. People say, are you crazy? You'll never get there, you'll fail. It was a goal that made us think differently. We wouldn't be here today unless we thought differently because just working harder doing the same old thing wouldn't have gotten us here. That was a big, big deal. The second thing was to not just accept what was out there, but to try to do research on some of the latest cutting edge techniques and science that was going on in literacy. And we applied that research to bring that in, to bring it into teaching teachers how to teach reading, to try to a more social emotional, all those other things that came in through research. That was a big deal. The third thing that happened to us was that we decided to use a different funding model. And that was to use a model of social venture capital, something that startups do. And we went out and were fortunate enough to find some investors who would loan us money, not loan us money, but give us money over a three-year period if we made certain objectives, and would help us fund this model so that we could go to the school district and pilot and experiment and be committed for multiple years, just not a flash in the pan. That was a big deal. And then finally, the biggest, one of the biggest deals we have are all of you in this room. We early on recognized that we could not do it alone, the school district could not do it alone, and it had to be this whole community jumping in together from birth to nine, uh, to nine years old to try to solve all these issues that are outside the school walls. So when you take a look at understanding where we've been and where we are at the present time, I think we've truly learned this lesson of when you know more, you do better. So with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Moore. Thank you, sir. So what I would imagine is the learning or the literacy capital of America would be is when a, a child is born, they receive services, uh, the parents receive services as they leave the hospital. They know exactly where to get support, how to help guide, nurture, love, and grow their child. And those services begin from the time that they leave the hospital as they go into pre-K, as they go into kindergarten. And the classrooms that are designed to meet the individual needs of kids. They're no longer designed to pull kids to the middle or to provide the exact same lesson to every single kid as they move through the process, but design education to maximize the full potential of all children, which means we're going to recreate what a child is exposed to. Giving the same child everything that is the same is a disservice to children. So creating school systems that design a pathway for children uniquely designed to meet their individual needs. That's the school system that we're trying to create. The expectation that we should have as a community is that is a non-negotiable. Living in the literacy capital of America, 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 <laughs> that's the expectation. We want our school board members, we want our county commissioners, we want everyone who's elected to say it's non-negotiable. Our school system, our community is going to be solely focused in nurturing and loving and growing our children. We had to keep the main thing the main thing. It's universal. As divided or different thoughts we may have as a community, what's non-negotiable is how we invest in our kids. That's the community that we want to create. That is fundamental. You know, the raising of scores or getting to, to 90% uh, will only happen after we all stand up and say, this is the expectation that we have for our community. Regardless of what you do in the community, you are solely invested in supporting and growing and loving our neighbors in order to ensure that becomes the reality. That's what brought me here. That's what I know to be true, and I know it is a reality, and it can be done. Our current reality, you little Jim Collins, um, teachers are more stressed out than they've ever been. And you know what? That's a good thing. 
Because as we sat with principals yesterday, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, principals yesterday for about three hours. And this was a planning session on how to help them plan for the second part of the year. And part of that conversation is about how do you celebrate? How do you acknowledge? How do you invest in your teachers? Because they're stressed. Why are they stressed? They see kids that have been in their classrooms for 15, 20, 25 years. They know where they should be. But as a result of the pandemic, they're not there. And they know the burden that they have on them that they truly accept and they endorse and, and they allow it to come into them because they want their children to be successful. But where they see them as a result of where they've typically been over the course of years is not where they, they're happy with it. So we're happy that they're not satisfied with the impacts of the pandemic. That's the truth. We're seeing children coming back to school after a year, a year and a half of being away in a typical adolescent environment. And we see more of those typical adolescent behaviors being displayed that we've ever seen before. Adolescent behaviors, if not dealt with, dealt with if not supported correctly, become more egregious or aggressive behaviors. Our system is designed, and has always been designed, to hold, have the capacity to hold a certain weight or a certain volume of those adolescent behaviors. But when you're seeing significantly more, we have to recreate and repurpose and reevaluate how we're providing support and connecting and building relationships with parents to address those adolescent behaviors because we cannot let them get or not allow them not to be unaddressed. So we're moving forward and we're celebrating the data that I shared at the very, very um, beginning of the school year. We're, we're in a much better place in reading. But math across the state and across the nation is going in the absolute wrong direction. So as much as we're focused in on literacy, uh, we're going to hit that 90% and we're going to keep our, uh, need to keep our eyes on, on math. So that's where we want to be collectively as a community. And that's currently where we are right now today. Thank you. So just to, to Dr. Morton Ray, in 2025, what are, some, what are some of the, what it looks like now? Just two or three. Can you say it just in a simple phrase? What would it look, what is it going to look like in 2023? We're standing there now. What do you see? 2025. 2025, sorry. <laughs> what I see is that uh, the DNA of this community has changed dramatically, that we have brought Everybody in this community knows that reading is important to the lifeblood of this community. That getting this community, getting all our civic leaders, all our government officials, all our state officials, everybody talking about this game of how important literacy is, is absolutely key. And with that, we also need to try to figure out how do we attract the best um, uh, educators uh, and uh, teachers that we possibly can. And by doing that, we make it easy for them to live here. We, give them uh, we help them with finding affordable housing, all those other things that make living in Vero Beach and Indian River County viable for them. So that's where we are, a literacy capital of the world. Great, great. And a place that's irresistible to live for educators here. So in 2025, all the suits that I brought from Miami will fit me again. And <laughs> COVID, wait. Um, but one thing that, that comes to mind in, in 2025, everyone knows. Everyone can speak and communicate the resources that are available. It's not just the folks in this room. It's just not the teachers in our school. Uh, the awareness around the resources and how we are in just not the literacy capital of America, but all of the resources and support is fully understood by everyone in the community. It's just not us pushing out the information. It's ingrained within all of us. We all can share. It, 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 your, ah, your, your child's need some support, go A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. It just becomes secondhand information that we all know and can share. I think when we, that's ob obtained, there's a, a solid piece of evidence we're moving in the right direction. Great. Thank you. Great. Yeah, and again, speaking from outside of this system here, what a contribution that is to the rest of the communities in the United States. No one has taken this on fully. And they would have, you, we would have a model for the rest of the country and the world. 
Okay, so one of the things about learning is that the, 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 the conditions continue to change. You have to be nimble and able to see what's going on and to use what's going on because you're never, the river never is the same twice, right? You don't step into the same river. So one of the things that happened, we started this journey, we were thinking about third grade literacy. And what happened is a lot of advances in neuroscience. You've been, you've been seeing them everywhere. We're learning a lot more about how the brain works and how we learn, and, and now it's time to really make sure that those things are synced up with what we're doing in education. And again, Indian River is, is a place that that's happening. And so we're going in the next two stories, we're gonna give you some examples about some model programs which are exactly what's wanted and needed. They've been tested, they work, and now uh, what the question is how to get these to everybody. So I wanna bring up, uh, Andrea and Vicki, come on up and tell us your story. Andrea's going to go first because birth comes before older children. <laughs> How logical. Actually, I will, I will dispute. I think literacy begins before birth when baby's in the valley. So. <laughs> um, so you might be wondering why Vicki and I are up here as we are CEOs of uh, health-related organizations, and that is because we, in the Moonshot communities, we see connections where others do not. We acknowledge that literacy is a social determinant of health. So this is one of my favorite slides. So it, oftentimes people want to hand their health care right over to their providers, their doctors. But really, as we look at this slide, very little of it belongs to your doctor. And it, you look at the top and you look at socioeconomic factors, and what is that first one? Education, that is literacy. So we acknowledge in this community that literacy is an important part of this, and that the integration of health and literacy is imperative in us achieving this moonshot goal. Yeah. So as you can see, Vicki and I have done everything we can to ensure that literacy is embedded in everything we're doing with health. So when we are at Cleveland Clinic, as Ralph Turner is here representing Cleveland Clinic and the ladies from the hospital district, thank you guys for being here. As Healthy Start comes bedside to every single mother that gives birth in our community, we talk about breastfeeding, safe sleep, health-related things, but we also hand them a book. We talk about reading to your baby, talking to your baby, and building that baby's brain because we consider it language nutrition, just as important as nutrition and health care. And so we pick up the baton when the babies come to Treasure Coast Community Health and see one of our um, dozen or so pediatricians. And I joined MCAN about four years ago, before COVID, and I was really excited. Thank you, Judy. Um, <laughs> it's real... I particularly have that problem. Sure, we can do that. So I went back very engaged and excited, and I went to one of the medical staff meetings with our pediatricians, and I said, I've got something new we want to talk about. We want to talk about literacy. And they said, in 20 minutes, give the shot, go through all the developmental assessments, teach the parents what the child is doing well, teach them what the next steps are, make sure that we get the safety factors in. Are you nuts? <laughs> and I said, okay, so you are wonderful teachers, but I got it. You're not the sole responsible party for this. So we started small. We started with their ideas. What would make it easier? Put little libraries in our waiting room. We try to get them right back, but the reality is, is when we have our medical assistants go up to the door, the first thing they see is a mom who says, just a minute, I'm, I'm texting. Okay, she's not paying attention to her little one. We need to re-engage them with visual cues. So in addition to the little libraries that we put up, we start putting up posters, showing moms with toddlers pointing to things because you can't read if you don't have the vocabulary, okay? And I got really engaged in this, honestly, because health literacy, as you pointed out, is awful. When I was a kid, if someone didn't, was not literate, in my hometown, it meant that somewhere between 8th and 12th grade, they didn't do well in school and or dropped out. When I started at Treasure Coast, I was advised, make sure your literature for your parents is at a 4th to 5th grade level. And I went, what? 
oh, it's because of foreign language. No, it's not. My grandmother read a German newspaper every single morning, and she was literate, okay? So having different um, languages is not the issue. It's the poverty level. And so we started looking at that as a team. And then COVID happened. And in addition to giving out vaccines, my staff recognized that parents need to still feed their kids. And so we contacted the food bank. We started making food available in cartons right at our centers. Not because it was something special that I wanted to have as bragging rights later. I was just so impressed that they understood the connection between what affects them outside of that 15 or 20 minute visit, even if it is monthly as little ones, and what we need to do. That's why we engaged with Dodgertown Elementary as a community school, because we see all the psychosocial barriers um, of things. But again, even though my locations are, our locations, sorry, I didn't mean to be possessive about that. Our locations are growing and our staff is expanding. The reality is that we also need to engage others. And so our Rotary Club started putting out little free libraries, okay? Now, do we need a book in every child's hand? Yes, that's the right answer, yes. I get that over and over again. Why do we need to do that? There is something special about cuddling up with a child that's young and making sure that they can feel the emotion involved. I love all these happy faces for that reason because learning should be a joy and that's what we try to install when our parents come in, okay? It's not what you did wrong, it's the joy of learning and helping them because in many cases, the mom, the multiple aunts, the good friends that I had that were all encouraging me as a new mother may not be there. They're working, they're struggling themselves to keep themselves together. So we need to have all of you engage as partners, and not just about learning. I hope I've made that clear. Everybody shouldn't focus on reading. We need to focus on the building blocks and the barriers to it, and remove those barriers. And that's my speech. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, so future. So in, t in 2025, we are in 2025, and Thank goodness all healthcare providers are as passionate about literacy as Vicki is. <laughs> and they see and are integrating um, literacy and reading into every interaction with families. And we acknowledge that literacy begins in the belly. It absolutely does. And I have to add on that when we started, when I started this journey, being science based, I thought this is going to be easy. But it's like peeling back the onion. With every step, with every layer we removed, there were a few tears. Mm. <laughs> but you got to stick with it, OK? It's an awesome goal. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thanks. <laughs> so there were two things I want, I want to uh, highlight in what we just heard about, which is that that thing that literacy is not another thing you have to add to the daily routine. It's actually part of the way we do whatever we do. And that was a great example of it. The other one is the need for innovative resourcing. That in order to make this available to everybody, we need to be as, as innovative about how we resource and fund things so we're not relying on all of the same things. We need multiple ways to do that. And what you heard was, uh, was examples of people looking for new resources, new people, new ways of getting people engaged. Um, and uh, you know, not just funding through ordinary ways, but all kinds of ways of making this happen. We can't settle for it not happening. We've got to find innovative ways to make it happen. All right, so uh, you all, we also have an amazing model for, um, for uh, quality preschool right here in Indian River County, one that it would be incredible to scale across the country, not just the county. And so what we want to do is hear about that, uh, th how that, I talked about greater than the sum of the parts. When you have people like this talking about from birth, and then you talk about preschool, and that isn't lost, it's actually built on, that's how you get a, uh, a multiplier effect, greater than the sum of the parts. So I want Shannon to come up and talk about. And actually, we want to do, invite people to just do some insights and action. Oh, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, I, I'm assuming that you are. You're right. I should be reminding you. Take a look at your insights and actions. And make sure you record anything that you heard that you want to be sure to remember because it moves you. 
it's something that you want to be sure that you think about when we, when we get together at the end. Okay? Great. All right, Shannon. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I was talking with Doc Jones this morning how amazing it is to be in this room with so many friends and seeing you and so many people here together collectively working on behalf of children. So thank you for being here today. This is just um, this is a wonderful um, meeting. So I am going to talk about early childhood education, and I have a video for you to watch. It's three minutes. It's the trailer for the documentary, No Small Matter, and it will tell you about the challenges and possibilities of early childhood education. Babies in the beginnings of humanity grew up in these very rich extended families. So in that kind of context, caring for children, teaching them, just getting the work done that you need, they all take place at the same time. And of course, the world that we live in now is a very, very different world from that. We have a society in which moms and dads both have to work to even support a family at all. The central problem is that the ability to provide that nurturing attention early in life is less than ever before. Good job. Minimum wage just isn't cutting paying bills. We couldn't afford to put him in preschool. Johnny's with him all day and I'm with him all night. Daddy, come on! This notion of the American dream, that is fundamentally not happening. Because of the fact that, you know, it took us that much to get her here, that putting her life in someone else's hands means so much. One years old, he can't say anything, he doesn't sit up, he doesn't walk. When those markers are set in childhood, they impact the way our bodies work for the rest of our lives. These are our children, our families in this country. Ignoring this, and just going on as if it's going to correct itself, that's a disaster for us as a society. This is not the way it's supposed to be. We have a deeper understanding now of how important these early years are and why. We're unlocking the secrets of the brain. First time in history. We never had a way to look into a baby's brain before. What's going on up there is rocket science. <laughs> Babies' early experiences create the foundation for all that follows. I want to be their Miss Honey. I want to be the one that's like, you can do anything! What's they are doing the work that will really fundamentally make a difference for the outcomes of these young children. I got my found a baby! Ed. This is amazing! We need leaders in every community to step up and say, every child should have access to high quality early education. If we get this right, our country will look dramatically different. Oh. Whatever we want to call it, childcare, preschool, home, we have to do it everywhere. Mic drop. <laughs> So what is fascinating about early learning is that humans have the capacity to learn more in the first five years of life than in any other five year span in the entirety of the rest of their lives. And babies are literally born learning. In that video, there was a small clip of um, a, a man sticking out his tongue and an infant imitating him. That baby was minutes old. Uh, we have know so much more about brain research and how the brain develops than we ever did before. You see, in the past, it was thought that babies were brained with pretty prepackaged brains that were pre-wired, and eventually they would come online and they would develop. But we know that's absolutely not true, that we actually know that brains are plastic and they change, and they're impacted by 
children's environment, about what parents do and what parents don't do, about where they live, about what they're eating. Uh, all of this is impacting grain, uh, brain development in our children. And brain development in children, they're the children's very favorite way to, for their brain to develop is with these connections and social interactions with their parents and their caregivers that really wonderful, rich give and take of conversation and deep relationships. So when we learn better, we do better, right? However, in this country, we've developed a childcare industry that is pretty much focused perhaps on old brain science that we don't really have to do much because it's all going to come online by itself, um, and or really just really helping families go to work and children to land somewhere safe to their parents need to pick them up. And what is the tragedy in all this is that we are not leveraging all that we know about brain science and that this moment in time for children, birth to five years, is the time when they have the capacity to learn the most. So you can see the neurons here in this slide of how robust this learning is for young children and declines after the age of five. So, when you think about early childhood, it's truly the foundation for life. So you can compare it to building a house. You can build a beautiful house and it'll stand for some time, but if you don't have that strong foundation, it's not going to stand the test of time. The same is for children. So we have a choice. We can either help children develop this very strong foundation and set them up to have the possibility to thrive, or we don't. So. I'll tell you a little bit about child care resources. So we are a grassroots nonprofit organization that has been working in this community to elevate and promote high quality early education. The majority of the families that we work with are considered part of the Alice population, asset limited, income constrained, employed, basically the working poor. Um, these families are working full time, but they're earning lower wages. However, the state and federal government have decided that they learn this much too much money to, to qualify for any state or federal subsidies. So child care resources came to be to really address the unique issue in our community that these hardworking families could not afford high quality early education. About 44% of the population in Indian River County are considered to be part of the Alice population. So we currently serve 158 children. We have more than 250 children on our waiting list. Our children are six years old to five years old. And, um, the, and we um, operate a nationally accredited child care center. Um, we're accredited through NACI, which is the National Association for the Education of Young Children, which is recognized as um, gold standard best practice in early childhood education. Unfortunately, less than 10% of all child care centers and kindergartens in our country have this national accreditation. Our school, we offer year-long affordable child care for our parents. We have well-trained teachers, low student teacher ratios, and an amazing environment. A really un another really unique part of our program is our wellness and early end intervention program. Thank you to the hospital district for helping us get this started. We on, um, in this department, we staff a registered nurse, a wellness coordinator, a child life specialist, and a case manager. They are really rounding out our holistic program looking at children and families and parents. And they, this department does everything from reviewing assessments and then coming up with strategies to help children be sure they're meeting their milestones. And that may need, mean that children need additional services, like speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, behavioral therapy, or mental health services. We bring all of those services on our campus and the children receive these services throughout the day while they're with us. The staff is also charged with ensuring that there's seamless communication between the therapist, the director of the school, the teacher, the parent, and the pediatrician, so that all of the adults in this child's life are all working to help this child meet their milestones and achieve um, all that they can be. Uh, we also have a robust professional development program, and we do this to try to help raise the quality of uh, early childhood education throughout the whole community. And so we offer professional three or four professional development workshops each year. Um, we bring what we call early education rock stars to the community, um, to, and thank you to the Community Foundation for allowing us to get this program started. Um, and we offer this uh, training to any early educator in the community. We actually have one on Saturday if you want to join 
join us. <laughs> We're bringing in Amanda Morgan, who wrote the book, Not Just Cute. And from 9 to 3, we'll ha have already 125 early educators who will be in attendance learning um, best practices and, in, in particular, how we can breach, um, bring together the science of and the research in early education to developmentally appropriate practice in the classroom. So let me know if you want to come. Uh, and we also, on top of that, we have a coaching program. We have two coaches and go to any child care center in the community and help implement the strategies we teach at the professional development or any training or mentoring programs. And then we have a um, credentialing program, which is a partnership with Indian River State College. And we um, have fast-tracked early educators to earn their staff degree. We've had 110 early educators go through this program already. Since 2014, we've trained 1,200 early childhood educators in our community. And we're just getting started. <laughs> We also this year are launching, um, uh, we hired some additional staff to help early childhood educators continue their education, whether that's um, a graduate certificate, earning that staff credential, associate's degrees, bachelor's degrees, or master's degrees in early childhood education. So. We'll go back to the very, thank you, Patrick. So here you see this wonderful um, picture of a brain. And it really is the, shows how you, what you have to go through to get to be able to learning. So if you look in the red portion of the brain um, state model here, you see the survival state. And it's truly asking, and, uh, am I safe? And it requires to, uh, to uh, and they need, the, the child needs to feel safe. The next section is the blue section, and that is the emotional brain. And they have to feel connected and cared for, and it truly asks, am I loved? And it requires connection. And then finally, get to the good stuff, the green section of the brain, which is the executive state. And the two other, the survival state and the emotional state needs need to be met in order to reach this section of the brain, which is where learning takes place. And so this is so important in helping children uh, develop ways to self-regulate and develop their social and emotional skills cannot be underestimated in early childhood education. And it is truly the crux of all that we're doing at Child Care Resources. So I'd like to share a quick story about a child in our program. We are um, in the middle of a five-year pilot program where we are able to um, care for up to 20 children who are currently experiencing homelessness. So about, um, about a year and ago, a year and a half ago, a little guy came to be enrolled into the program, 14 months old, could not walk, could not crawl, and had no vocabulary. And so the first thing we had him do, had him do was we had him evaluated by one of our physical therapists. Wanted to understand was there something physically wrong with the child or was it truly environment? Unfortunately, it was truly environment. He was living in a car and spent essentially the first 14 months of his life strapped into a car seat. So we enrolled him in our program, started intense physical therapy, occupational therapy, and physical therapy. A lot of one-on-one -on -one time with staff and volunteers. Fast forward to today, um, this little guy is crawling, running, and talking your ear off at our school. He still has some developmental delays, and we're working with him to get through those. But I know when we sent, hand him off to Dr. Moore in about a year, he is going to be thriving and ready for kindergarten. So philanthropy has given child care resources the opportunity to test programming and to find programming that uniquely fits the needs of this community. And we, it's not, and we also are able to deliver these services in research and evidence-based ways. So we are a model center, and there is a cost to all of this. And so uh, our four-year-olds in our program cost about $11,000 a year. We do receive up to $2,400 a year for the, from the state of Florida for, for our four-year-olds. Our infants cost us about $17,000 a year, and we receive no subsidies from the state for, um, to help pay for the services of those children. The good news is that this expensive program can pay back the, the community in spades. Because you heard earlier about the $1 invested gives you $13 um, in return, on the return on your investment. And that was research done by Dr. Heckman. And he looked at all the longitudinal studies from early childhood education, and he crunched those numbers. And he's a Nobel Prize winning economist, so it's just not me telling you that it's the 1 in 13 return on your investment. So the current state is that, yes, this 
is high cost, and yes, we're ready. We have our shirt sleeves rolled up and we're ready to do the work, but we aren't able to scale because of the funding issue um, to help get all of the children enrolled in high quality early education programs. So 2025, I have not aged a bit, <laughs> and um, all of the children in our community are enrolled in a program like Child Care Resources. Every parent has the ability to have access to have a high quality learning experience for their child. Early childhood educators in our community are embraced as teachers. They're not thought as babysitters. And our community deeply understands the need for social emotional development in young children and for teachers to understand the science of reading. Also, that all families have access to early intervention at the earliest ages and close to their homes so they're not having to drive far, and that children are receiving the services that they need. And most importantly, this community looked at the research and the science of what early education could do, but also understood the product, if you will, that Child Care Resources was producing and wanted to replicate that so that more children, when they're showing up to kindergarten, are ready. But they're not only being prepared for kindergarten, they're being prepared for life. Mm, great. <laughs> okay, so right now, look at your takeaways page. I want you to think about what is moving you about what Shannon was telling you is available here in, in Indian River County. Both what is, what is the insight about that, and what are the actions that you could actually bring to that? Tell you one of the things I was thinking about as as I was listening was just how how it's all here. What we need is our we know what we've got it. It's it's just how do we now make it available to the whole community? And that whole idea of investment that that uh, we have to shift our mindset to actually believe that if we do these things, those things that that the research tells us will happen will actually be available. We have to take a, a, we have to trust in our understanding of what that's, what's possible. And Shannon, your story really shows us that. Yeah. Okay, so in terms of that, that chain of value that are, is beginning to really take root here, um, on the way to having the kids show up ready to be, uh, to, ready for school, uh, we also learned that it isn't enough just to have people read. Ch children learn to read. We also learned that there's, like, like we need reinforcement of what we know. Even adults, especially adults do. Just like that, we need to be reinforcing learning in extended ways uh, throughout the educational process. And so we, have, we also have world-class <laughs> programs in doing that. So we have um, uh, Judy and Debbie are here to tell you about what's happening with extended learning, um, particularly the realization that schools can't do it alone. How did we fill that gap? And what's ready to be activated there? Thank you, Heidi. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're so lucky in Indian River County to have wonderful extended learning programs, um, programs that help kids before school, during school, after school, and over the summer to, to um, keep the gaps from, um, from affecting their learning. And um, it, it, programs like the Learning Alliance, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Crossover Mission, Daisy Hope, and, and um, Miss B's Learning Bees, Gifford Youth Achievement Center, all of these are just wonderful programs. But thinking back 10 years uh, ago, all of these programs, these agencies, were somewhat forced to work in isolation, a kind of work in silos and do their own thing. And what's been such a wonderful um, opportunity has been MCAN, when it's come on the scene, Moonshot Community Action Network, because it's allowed, with its growth and expansion, for uh, agencies and programs to do wonderful collaboration, quality collaboration with each other um, that's made such a difference. And more and more of our extended learning programs have um, taken 
up the opportunity to learn more about the science of reading. And that's been so critical um, in the overall process. I wanted to ask Debbie Arsenault to come forward because while we have so many programs, we have this wonderful best practice collaborative innovative program called Moonshot Academy. And it's, um, it's such a great example that I'd like her to share a little bit about that particular extended learning program. So for those of you who aren't maybe as familiar with extended learning opportunities, you can see the kind of quality there is out in the community. Debbie? Thanks, Judy. So before we move into the present and I share you a little bit more about Moonshot Academy, the program, I just want to get us present. We've been, we've been asking a lot of your executive functioning and your attention for the last little while. So I'd just like to invite you to take a moment to get into the present moment of your body, whatever that looks like or feels like for you. If you could just stretch down, up to the side, however that feels good to you. We are in the extended learning section. Yes. <laughs> so we're going to extend our bodies and I want you to think about one side is where we are and one side is where we want to be. Oh, nice. <laughs> Extend all the way through both of those full lines. Breathe into that and then close the gap. <laughs> As we come into this moment and just take a deep breath with me. Breathe it in. <sighs> Thank you. So I just wanted to bring us, we are on a big journey together and there's a lot of work happening and our brains are going a million miles a minute because all of those connections that Shannon really highlighted so beautifully are still going on right here right now as we are learning here together right so I just wanted to take a, a few moments to talk to you about what Moonshot Academy is what it is why it is and how it works as a well-designed best practice program so what is it? I mean, it's a, it's a, we know why we're here today. We're all here for the same reason, really, to invest in our children, to invest in our community, and to help kids learn how to read on the way to transforming our community, right? So Moonshot Academy's goal is to increase student achievement, and it's in that out-of-school time, after-school, and summer space, to close learning gaps and develop a love of reading through authentic learning experiences. Right? It's an after-school summer program funded through the Learning Alliance with community support, for struggling readers in first through third grade. So that's our, our target range there. And it's a learning lab for educators alongside the students. And we partner with the school district's extended day program to ensure access to even more students in the program. Now, I could tell you more about what it is, but I feel like it will be more powerful to show it to you. So I'm gonna show you a brief video. You're gonna see a familiar former principal and parent, hear from parents and see students in action. So the question that we're after as an organization and as a moonshot community is what does it take to create literate, compassionate, creative citizens who are lifelong learners and will improve our world? We have really taken a lot of time to work on foundational literacy and we believe that if we tackle this early on with our students and also address um, some reading inequities, making sure that our students have access to books at home and that they have really high quality interventions taking place that we can get them on grade level by third grade. And we know that when they're on grade level by third grade, statistics show that they're gonna have a much higher success rate in life. The Learning Alliance has offered us summer programming, a Moonshot Academy after school, and that allows teachers to learn as they're teaching really fun and engaging ways to teach literacy and to inspire our students so that they're not just extrinsically motivated, but they're intrinsically motivated to do better. The Learning Alliance's Moonshot Academy after school and summer is a learning lab for both the teachers and the students. All of the Learning Alliance's programs embrace what we call our enriched literacy framework. So that means we really are looking at how do we build the social and emotional conditions for students to be available to learn so that we can teach them the foundational literacy skills that they need and give them opportunities to apply their learning in really rich, dynamic ways. I've really enjoyed the Moonshot Academy as a teacher. I've been able to help the students make real world connections through the text and the um, institute and professional development has really equipped us to do that effectively, get the students engaged, and we've just learned so many strategies to make it an enjoyable experience for not only the kids, but for us as teachers as well. 
So in kindergarten, Carmen really didn't know as much as the other kids. She barely knew like sounds, letters, counting. So then when she got in first grade, she started the program Moonshot. Her confidence level is an all time high. <laughs> she loves going to school now. She loves being with the kids. It has benefited Carmen because when she gets to higher grades, she'll feel like, oh, well, I was in moonshot, so and this is what I learned here, so I'm gonna take what I learned and always keep it with me, always have it with me. So in Moonshot Academy, we target the skills the students need through small group tutoring, direct instruction. And we balance that with lessons and workshops that are really it's inspired by rich texts, like the books you see here on the table, that give students hands-on opportunities to do arts-integrated, project-based learning. So they're taking what they're reading and putting it into context, bringing it into the world. Right? So how we do that is just as important as what we do. Right? We know that we can't just say, sit down and learn, because I said so. I mean, maybe we could, but is that really going to get us to where we want to be right? and who we want to be as a community, as a society? Right? So what we do in this program is we've designed this program around this enriched literacy framework right? so that we, it takes social, emotional, foundational, and applied literacy to get to cultivating literate, compassionate, creative citizens who will improve our world, right? And when we focus in on the foundational approach, this is what the science of reading approach is all about, where we are both teaching directly and explicitly those foundational skills. So we can teach kids to decode our language and also build up that background knowledge and that vocabulary. So when those two pathways come together and they intertwine, that's what gets us to comprehension. That's what gets us to actually the goal of reading, right? To be able to do something with it, to understand what it is we're reading. So as Shannon pointed out, we need to, to feel emotionally invested and connected to what it is that we are learning. We literally can only care about things, only learn about things that we care about. That's how the emotional brain works, to get us to the juicy, high executive functioning, right? Or as Zaretta Hammond would say, to get kids' brains on fire. And isn't that what learning should be about, right? Here's what we want you to learn. Here's how we're going to get you there. We're going to get your brains on fire, right? When we know better, we do better. And that's why we follow this integrated framework. Again, it's not something on top of. It's all working together. So. What is the impact of Moonshot Academy? Well, students typically experience more than a 50% increase in reading proficiency with the support of this program. In fact, just yesterday, I was doing a tour of a Moonshot Academy, and the facilitator told me every single one of their Moonshot Academy kids kids and their iReady testing have moved out of the red into the yellow and some into the green. So we are moving those kids. <laughs> <laughs> and you heard it in the video. A big takeaway is this confidence factor, right? These are some feedback from some of our parents. Helped build my daughter's confidence and get her reading better. She's now reading books I wouldn't have imagined her reading at the beginning of the year. MSA is good at building up the student and empowering them to be confident with reading. We hear this over and over again. And this helps kids who are struggling and being told you're behind. There's something bad. You have to get better. It gives them confidence to do better, to grow, right? And we know kids love Moonshot Academy. These are all things said directly to me. This is the most fun I've ever had in class before ever. <laughs> they were making art bots. This was last week. Ms. Debbie, I'm just getting so smart. <laughs> Irish school was like this every day. We asked these kids to stay until 5.30 after school to sit down and be tutored. And also, they go home and say, I wish school was like this every day. They love learning in Moonshot Academy. And it goes beyond third grade. Zayden, I believe, is in high school now. When he was a sixth grader, he told us, when I did the Moonshot program, it opened up my whole life. Whole life, sixth grader. <laughs> They try and make it fun. That's what I loved about it. It made me really confident about reading. 
I'm reading the same books as my friends and it feels good. Without the Moonshot Academy, I might not be doing so well in school right now. So I get moved. It's just water coming out of my face. So this is what we're doing in Moonshot Academy. We are cultivating a love, a culture that supports a love of reading, a love of learning, and we're doing that based on, whoa, what <laughs> best practice tells us supports learning and reading, right? This is not an either or proposition. This is a both and. One does not happen without the other. This is what Freire means when he says we take the word to the world. Reading is about doing something with it. So we are cultivating compassionate, creative, literate citizens. Thank you. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. And Where are we going? Where are we going, Judy? Yeah, doesn't that just get you excited about extended learning programs, right? Woo! <laughs> I, and, and there's such a perfect example of the kind of impact that can come from, from extended learning. So, yeah, I have three um, visions for the future, Heidi, okay? So, um, first of all, what I want to say is 2025, Everyone in this community is going to realize how important extended learning is and that literacy and extended learning is not a spectator sport. We all have to get involved. Cindy, right? I mean, Cindy is, um, Cindy and Deb Long have been such proponents for bringing the community and uh, into the schools. And let's face it, schools can't do it alone, right? And, and learning doesn't just take place in schools. So business, if you're here from business, if you're here from government, if you're here from from nonprofit, we're all needed to get involved and um, to help fund uh, well-designed programs that um, are going to continue to make a difference. And let's face it, we want learning everywhere in this community, so the um, books in the barbershop, right, and um, little libraries in the parks, all of that's really important. Okay, number two, schools. Um, schools have done an amazing job of identifying kids who really need more help outside the school day. And so they have worked tirelessly to connect parents and the nonprofits to the kids that need extra help, and it's working. It's successful. And number three, number three is that public-private partnerships have raised enough money that we can sustain good quality services, right? Because they're really necessary. And that part of the funding is required to go to good quality training and um, to coaching, ongoing coaching, so that we can all say to our community as extended learning providers that we are totally accountable to this community and we're meeting good quality standards. So that's my vision that's for, awesome. yeah, for 2025. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. Thanks, Debbie. Um, so I am Marie O'Brien. I'm with the Learning Alliance. Uh, the Learning Alliance is a managing partner of our uh, MCAN group. Um, we have a little exercise because, you know, Judy and Debbie just talked about extended learning, but also schools can't do it alone. So I think it, I've, I have a great example of how to share how schools can't do it alone. So I need five volunteers, please, one per table. That means if you if you won a um, prize, if you're one of our top three in Kahoot, you do not have to send someone up. So if you did not, if I could have one person from each here, please. <laughs> All right, I got Phil, <laughs> Vicki, Terry, Jeff, I need one more, please. All right, Chris Ryle, thank you, Dr. Ryle. All right, if you guys will line up, um, and I, the room's a little tight, so I'm gonna have you, you're gonna be doing baby steps. So um, we've got one, two, three, five. So our five people, Dr. Cowie, will you be part of this? Thank you very much. So happy to see you in person. Um, these are our these are a group of kindergartners. So we're all here and we're excited to be here. But look at you standing in a line, I'm so proud. Yeah. <laughs> Terry and Phil, you can stay where you are. Vicki, Chris, Jeff, and Trisha, um, I want to say what happened is these guys didn't have 
quality child care. So they're coming to kindergarten and they're not, actually I just need, um, I'm gonna let Vicki, I'm gonna let Chris stay up front, but I'm gonna have Vicki, Jeff, and Trisha take three steps back because they're actually coming into school behind. So, but they're all excited. They're all excited to be here. It's the first day of kindergarten and they're in our school and they just had a great teacher and they're gonna move up three steps. Each of them, everybody moves up three steps, please. They had a great teacher, now stop. But what happened to Vicki and Jeff was they actually didn't make it to school very often. They had chronic absences. <laughs> so the waves were up, surfs up. Um, so they didn't make it as much, so I'm gonna ask Vicki and Jeff to take two steps back, please. And now they actually have to take two more steps back because the days they did come to school, they were so confused because they hadn't been there that they're even further behind, so they have to take two more steps back. And sadly, Trisha, her family's going through some hard times, so she has so much stress at home that she has to take one step back. But Terry, Phil, and Chris are doing great. And, but now, um, summertime is here, so now I'm gonna ask Terry, Phil, and Chris, and everybody to actually take another step back because they just lost about a month or two of learning, and now we're gonna go to first grade. Yeah, you have to go take a step back, too. So we're gonna go to first grade now, though. And again, they have a great teacher. They're in first grade. Everybody take a few steps up. Normally it would be eight, but we're gonna just take a few steps up. And Vicki got into a Moonshot Academy program, and she's gonna take another step up. And one more, she's actually getting closer to her peers. But she's gotta stop, because she was a little still behind. Jeff and Trisha, unfortunately, they're still chronically absent. They're missing more than 20% of school. Then we ask them to take a step back. So you can get a feel for, this is just a quick exercise to see how important it is that um, kids are attending school, that they're in a quality preschool, that they come to kindergarten ready. Because even when they come here and we have fabulous educators and great um, programs with extended learning, we still need to do things to close the gap. So if you will give our uh, children a round of applause here. <laughs> And uh, again, if you have any, you know, um, your insights, your uh, takeaways there, any insights or actions, things that you think can be done, write that down. Um, one thing I'll give you a hint is um, sharing that message about the importance of attending. You're making it easier for your children to attend school. Uh, if you have staff that work for you, you know, letting, helping out. So I'm gonna hand this back over to Heidi. Great. Thank you. Thank you, that was great. Uh, one of the things that I, I that, happens here that goes so quickly, and if I had anybody that I work with who's not from Indian River County, I would point out to them, so I want to point out to you, the difference in the original intent of Moonshot was getting kids to read 90% literacy by third grade, and we had a second implied objective, which was to do it in a way that the community came along for the ride, and the community began to learn how to do learning into intransigent issues, so that any you could do that with any issue you had in this community. You would learn through the literacy challenge how to do that. So that was kind of an early idea. Now, when people talk about what the vision is of the, of the outcome of Moonshot, of, of this work, the outcome is, and I'm gonna say it really slowly because people here say it like duh, 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 duh. The vision now is literate, creative, compassionate citizens who will, Im lifelong learners, by the way, who will improve our world. Do you see the difference in a vision? When a vision is stated like that, imagine what, what that kind of vision, how that changes how we do what we do when we know that's what we wanna have. And this was one of the, the evolutionary steps that happened in this, in this community in the last 10 years. And I remember the first time I heard it, I had to write it down. That it was, that that's what literacy meant. So in that sense, you are, you are in a whole other planet in terms of what people even think literacy is. But it's literate, creative, compassionate citizens, lifelong lear learners who will improve our world. Part of my vision is that every citizen of this county can say that because they have an experience that that's what we're going for. 
I, it's just amazing. So now for our fifth story, uh, one of the biggest challenges in the gap that we have to fill is public awareness, is making sure people know. Just like we're learning more and more here, all of us, no matter where you are in the process, we've learned lots here today. So public awareness is really critical to keep keep the momentum, keep building something larger than any of the sum of the parts. So this last, um, this last story is about, and we're coming down the home stretch to action and commitment, is, is about a, the campaign for, that for public awareness that's going to be happening soon. So you can understand what it is, why, why it's formed that way, and what part you can play in it. And I think it's Barbara and Doc Jones, Doc Jones is part of this, yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you all for being here. I'm Barbara Hammond, co-founder of the Learning Alliance with Liz Remington. And um, I have to say that uh, this journey over the last 10 years, Jim Collins, who if you, any of you all have read Jim Collins, Good to Great, um, he said that the two paradoxical qualities that great leaders have, and I consider every one of us in this room striving for this, um, is unbelievable grit and humility. And when we started the journey, we actually were asked to put a date by when we'd get 90%, and we said four years. <laughs> Ex-business people, Ray, me, Liz, an educator, yep, you know, there's a way to do this, and it's easy. So the humility that we've gained in this journey, the reason we're here today is um, it takes all of us, and I honestly think that it starts with our own hearts and our own, you know, learning journey. And I have to say, as a good student who worked really hard, I remember stories where the teachers were working with the struggling students and not paying attention to me. And I was upset. I'm like, I have worked really hard. Why are you paying attention to the disruptive ones? And then I had children. <laughs> All right, so they were awesome until they got into kindergarten. Um, we had done all the reading, writing, you know, playing, singing, and I was told that they were failing. And it wasn't public school, it was private school. And um, the teacher looked at me and, you know, I was the problem and my kids were the problem. So lots of shame, not knowing what to do. And, you know, first you get angry at the teacher. And then you get curious because we have humility and learning brains and we say, what's getting in the way? And David Moore, I know you say the most important thing is for us to get together and say, what are the barriers and how do we overcome them? That's what we're trying to do and build. So what are the barriers and how do we overcome them? And Liz and Ray and I went around the country and saw solutions and realized that teachers across the country didn't have access to the best practice solutions. And you're seeing here well-designed solution and not all of our kids and teachers have access to them because we don't value as a community and nation funding programs that work at scale. So my child who was failing kindergarten just graduated during COVID as a mechanical engineer from college. And my other child is still struggling to get through college but he's making it and he looked at me the other day and he said, mom, if the tutor hadn't helped me in ninth grade, my life would have been lost. So an educator and a community and a village that has our kids and their and parents' backs and provides the supports of well-designed services, we can hit 90%. We can't do it without everybody in this room. The FACES campaign, if we look at 2025, it is today. It is the people who sign up today for the FACES campaign to get public and visible. I want to host an event. I want to say why this matters to me. And I'm going to talk about the action I can take because of the skills, the networks, um, access to funds that I can bring to make this community uh, the literacy capital. David Moore said it's going to be a literacy capital. He didn't know that we said that 10 years ago, right? That's the magic, the emergent learning magic. But today, we're creating the momentum with the leaders in this room to take this to the next level. And we don't know the answer. As Heidi said, there is no blueprint. You guys are going to figure it out. And Marie and Peggy are going to talk about this FACES campaign. Please join it. Please get public and visible with why this is important to you and what actions you can personally take to move us forward. You may have noticed we're talking kind of what's happened in the past. And we're going to show you a video that shows um, a little bit to, we felt like this um, explains the project so well. So um, Dr. Uh, Peggy Jones, um, the 
School District and the Learning Alliance and our MCAN group are all going to be co-hosting this. We are here's what we are inviting you to join. So this is going to give you a little preview. By the way, that's my daughter when she was in third grade. She is now 20. <laughs> I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, all engine running. We have a liftoff. Learn to read. Me to learn. This is my moonshot moment. As a school district, we know the importance of early learning literacy, and that third grade is a pivot point for learning to read, so you can read to learn. Schools can't do it alone. We know learning starts at birth, and if students are ready when they arrive in kindergarten, we can teach them to read. That's why we're co-leading the Faces of Early Literacy Project. And as a school board member in Indian River County, I am so proud we are partnering with MCAN to be part of this FACES Early Literacy Project. We want to share the message of the Moonshot Moment goal with the entire community to start the conversation about third grade literacy. We are working with our MCAN group to make sure Indy River County is a literacy capital of the world. It's going to open the door for everyone to understand that third grade literacy is the foundation for all learning. In the coming weeks, you will continue to see more and more of our faces of our young learners displayed throughout our community. So to kick off the Literacy Week 2022, we invite the community to join this learning journey with us to get everyone on board. Share the Moonshot message with your friends. Join us at the Moonshot events. Talk to MCAM members to ask questions and learn more. We appreciate your support, all the partnerships we have with our community leaders, elected officials, businesses, doctors, churches, and the Moonshot Community Action Network because it takes everyone to help our children learn. That was one of the Kahoot questions. How many uh, national recognition awards have we gotten from the Pace Center? I want to thank Erica Reardon, too. Erica um, is our videographer, photographer. <laughs> she manages to, you know, we always say a video is worth, if a picture is worth a thousand words, a video is worth 10,000. She always manages to condense these down to, you know, share the message in a meaningful way. So, um, uh, Doc Jones, I'd love if you want to come up and talk a little bit about faces. Thank you so much. It certainly is my pleasure to be here, um, joined by our new chair, Terry Berenborg, and I know Dr. Schiff was here, so it's important for school board members to see what is happening in our community. I have always believed that public education is a foundation, one of the main foundations of our country. We are here to serve all students. On October 26, the school board signed a proclamation that we would be a partner with this campaign. The faces of early literacy, today's readers are tomorrow's leaders. Uh, Marie asked me to share a little bit about my story and what I have experienced. I've been in public education for 43 years. Started when I was 12, but not really. <laughs> I have been in every position you could imagine. Teacher, coach, dean, athletic director, principal of two middle schools, principal of one high school, principal consultant, executive director of secondary, school board member, and I had the pleasure of being at the Florida High School Athletic Association for five years, where I work with student athletes. So it's always been about the kids. And the one thing I just want to share as a former middle school and high school principal is this. When students came to the middle school on grade level, they soared. There was nothing that was stopping them. When you get into six through 12, it's content driven, standards driven. It is an elementary also, but it becomes really tough. You need to learn how to read before you get there to sixth grade. Otherwise, it's all catch up. And we noticed that. So from day one, we were a little bit reactive. Now when they come into high school, again, day one, 
if you're not on reading grade level, we had to do a few things. Take away an elective, put in another math or English class. Make sure our after school program was doing the job it needed to do. Work with the after school programs in the community to make sure they were helping us target what we needed to do. Because if they are not reading on grade level, it's very, very tough to pass whether it was the FCAT or the FSA. And now with the new progress monitoring, we have no clue what they'll have to do at this point. <laughs> but, but we'll be ready. I promise we'll be ready. But you know, when I look back, we've all heard this before. Sometimes it just takes one person, one person to make sure you're working with that child in mentoring. You know, I've been in the community for a long time right now. I'm volunteering with Crossover Mission. I'm on the Daisy Hope Board. I work with MCAN. It's all about our students. So when students didn't graduate the high school, it wasn't usually because of the 24 credits or the 2.0. It was that test. So we had to continually work with them on that test. I guess my main message is this. Invest early. Invest. Get them ready. Get them ready. We all know it's birth or before birth, whatever happens. But get them ready so they are ready in kindergarten. So they are reading on third grade, reading level in third grade. It's just so very, very important. Shannon, what you said earlier about, I mean, it just touched my heart about that young baby who was in a car for about 14 months and, and, and what we are doing now to make sure that um, he or she catches up. But when I look around this room, it's our community. I feel so privileged to be here, not just as a school board member, but as a lifelong learner, as an educator. So at the end, when we look at how are we going to do this, everyone, everyone must take part in this. It, it's our obligation. It's our obligation to do so because we all benefit. We all see the stats on that. We all benefit if children are ready to learn. And when they graduate from high school, they go on to their next journey, whether it's college, university, uh, right into the career you know, workforce, into the armed services. So they are ready. I'm, again, very proud of the school board for doing this and moving forward. And I ask, you know, you may sure, I'm not sure I can do this. There's anyone, anyone at, that, uh, at MCAN or Learning Alliance, they will help you. It could just be one person doing this and just saying, we are committed. We are committed. So again, thank you for being here. Invest in them early. Thank you very much. I've got one. Thank you, Doc. Um, if you can see, I have, so this campaign you saw in the video, we, we did this um, almost 10 years ago. Uh, so again, faces of early literacy, today's readers are tomorrow's leaders. I have some posters up here. These were the faces of literacy back in, uh, we actually took their pictures in 2012, so almost 10, 10 years ago. Um, my daughter is on the end there. Uh, these are all her, you know, her friends and classmates. And LaDonna, will you help me, would you? Because you're nice and tall. I want to show. Um, how, what this project is, is this is how big these faces posters are. Thank you. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I, you're, you get a better view then. Um, so they're five, they're five feet tall. They're all my size. Um, and how the, this is part of an international movement called the Inside Out Project, and we are participating in it again. Our um, goal with the campaign is that each of you and your colleagues and friends will agree to host an event. And what that means is we will have these um, photos. We're going to take pictures of the children in our community, our faces of early literacy. We're going to paste them up on the exterior of your buildings, facilities. If you don't have an exterior and you only want to do something and we just post something like this in the lobby, we can do that. Um, so we'll, we'll work with you. We want to do all the heavy lifting for this, but because these are so big and so beautiful, what they'll do is they'll create a conversation. People are going to drive by, they're going to stop, they're going to come to the bank and ask what is that, and that's your opportunity to talk about it. Um, Barbara talks about humility, and one of the things we didn't, we learned when we learn better, we do better. And what we um, learned from that first campaign is just putting it up and asking people to to do that with us is great, but we also need to ask everyone to take action. So what we are um, going to ask you for next is you know, can talk at your table, but and on your commitment card and your insights and takeaways, um, let us know if you'll, ta you'll take action by hosting an event 
If you do not have a structure to host it, but you want to attend, you can let us know that as well. Um, we would really love to list all of you in our directory as Moonshot supporters. You can just check that first box and let me know how to place your name. Um, again, Pat is our reporter from 2025. Thank you, Pat. Um, we want to feature all of you as you know heroes on this journey. So in 2025, when the reporter is here asking, how did you do this? And we're going to say, on December 9th, we all came together in this room and we started to talk about this. And then this is really that, you know, the visual campaign to get it started. But when you host an event, again, we'll do the heavy lifting for you. You just, you can show up, we'll give you an invitation to send out. When your guests are there, you'll share messages about this and what matters and you can issue challenges or you know, say how you're going to help. And then um, we'll start pasting up those uh, posters. And then also, when you see this around town in 2022, uh, we're going to ask you to tell people what it's about. So we do have over here, we've got a calendar. There's um, some dates if you already know, I want to do it, and I have something happening in my, you know, at the college on this date. Hey, I'll take that week. So you can fill that in, and if we can honor your date, we will do that. Um, so I think I'm going to have Heidi come back to this. And again, I want to I, I want to thank everybody for being here. This is so exciting to me to see everybody together in the room. It's been almost two years. Um, so instead of our little Zoom squares, it's great to see all your faces. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. All right. So this is the this next ten minutes is the mo most important ten minutes in the day, and uh, it really is about how this, how you, how you took this in and what it, what it actually called you to do or be. And um, I want to say something. It's, it's about being part of a tipping point. And I want to say something about tipping points. The first uh, thing that we all discussed at the vision session in 2011 was the shape of adaptive change, that most people think that change happens like this. It's a linear thing, and you're looking for the results along the way. And what we know from watching emergence, and we watch real change, real collaborative change, it goes like this. So we're right about here. So what took 10 years is now a platform. It's now the garden for the thing to explode. So the tipping point of what we looked at back then We've been making steady progress, but what happens in this kind of change is that now the tipping point happens much more easily and much more swiftly. So things are in place now, and what you do has a tremendous impact on what and how that gets activated. So what we want you to do now is take the next 10 minutes in your tables. You can look at the, at the, uh, the um, commitment form that, that Marie just told you about, and start to look at the things you could do, but also look at the notes you took and kind of synthesize for yourself what are the most important takeaways that you got from today? And what are you gonna go out and start sharing? You know, the vision was about that everybody's speaking the same thing. We're all sending the message that this matters. It is the single most important priority in, this, in your family, in this community, in this nation. So, uh, so I want you to synthesize that on your, on your notes. I've got notes all over mine. And, um, and then start looking at how you can make this active and how you can get out there and share it. And, and if you have time, you do it. You get, take some time to just do it individually, and then you have time in the group. You can start to share with each other what you started to see, what started coming up impact that that has with the homelessness situation and what we can all do in this community if we work together. Right. There was a lot of discussion about funders and understanding about the whole person. And instead of siloing funding streams to really think about health and wellness and literacy and homelessness and everything as one instead of siloing. Beautiful. I, I have to tell you, one of the things I brag on you guys about is, is the incredibly diverse and comprehensive ways that you look at funding like that, where, where the, one of the first, um, it, it, uh, you can take it for granted because you're here, but I'm telling you that the, f the way that Ray led people to invest in the beginning as a, as a venture, a capital kind of approach, which allowed the f what was being funded was the learning, not just individual solutions. I can't tell you how many communities would give anything for that kind of mindset about what they're doing so that you have the freedom to develop a whole 
a whole view of, of what you're doing. It's great. Thank you. So I'll, I'll kind of tag, like, add on to that because, you know, for years we've thought, well, this is United Way saying this, um, <laughs> you know, the funders are kind of who's important because that's who we need to win over. But for years we've also had on our wish list to have elected officials, community leaders in the room. I, for one, am super impressed to have the amount of elected officials and representatives from those municipalities join us today. And Mayor Brackett pointed out as one of his insights, you know, it goes beyond just bringing them to the room. I mean, that took years, right, for us to get there, just to get them in the room. But the buy-in from them. Yes, it's important to have the funders understand, but that's not where the decision ends. Like, if we don't have the real people in the community making the decisions, the influencers, the community leaders, the elected officials that understand the work we're doing, it's not, the funders aren't going to make the only difference. So great. that is our table's biggest insight today. Great, great. That's the tipping point. That's great. Crystal, it is such a joy to meet you. You as well, thank you. <laughs> oh, um, now I forgot what I was going to say. All right, so we came in second, but we got all of our points right in Kahoot. I'm petty, I had to say that. Um, so we echoed everything that was already shared, but one of the statements that was from the, the very fabulous Shannon when she shared her space, um, these are our children and these are our families. Um, so we felt like the persons that were missing from the room today were, were the families, were the parents, because we can't make decisions for people without them being here and without their voices being represented. So that was a big takeaway for us. And then our city manager of Felsmere over here, he said, um, no, I'm lying, it's not you. You said the parents, good job there. Casey from IRC said, um, having a navigator to help with, we, we know that people don't know the resources, we know they're illiterate to that, so how do we create this 211 for education support so that we know this is where you go? So how do we make MCAD more facing to families so that they can say, hey, my kid needs this support and this is who I can call? So those were the huge takeaways that we had. And then the last one was, taking away some of the acronyms because we'll get parents to put the cell phones down when they feel like they can understand and access the language and the vocabulary. So using words that are on their level, not on our level, and when we do that, we'll get a lot more of the engagement. Crystal, thank you. So we had two great big takeaways with, um, and it came from Dr. Moore when he stated that building learning experiences to meet the individual child's need. So we can cookie cut everything, but until we can understand the individual child's need, and that will be the huge takeaway from there. Also meeting economic disparities, when Andrea spoke about being able to plan these activities and put these systems in place, to be able to meet the economic disparities, because that's one of the huge problems that we have, is that we have to understand where the child is coming from in order to get the child to where we want them to be. So those are our huge takeaways with, uh, you know, meeting the MCAM vision. Great, thank you, LaDonna. Heidi asked me to close. I, I don't, Heidi just started speaking. I mean, Heidi lives in Santa Fe. When we first met her, she was in New Jersey. She um, did breakthrough strategy for Fortune 500 companies for much of her life. And when we met her 10 years ago, she said, um, I'm going to devote my life to social enterprises that are going to improve this world. Um, so she travels the world, literally takes our story, as she said, all over the world. And um, so some people might have thought she was just an interested bystander from the community. She's, um, she's, she's a brilliant leader and drives learning um, across, across the country. So Heidi, you are the magic that created the DNA that is in this room that we are taking outside. Um, <laughs> so anyway, this is, a, this is a great day. I think that... Um, you know, one of the things I would love us to do, I've heard a couple things at our table, which is awareness, parent awareness. Crystal, you start talking about what it takes to build that. We don't really know right now how to use spaces in that way. And if this room could figure out how you know, there's a week of parent awareness things where parents are actually there. You know, we said there are homeless families who their kids are not in school for a year. We just heard at our table. 
nine kids not in school for a year. Um, and people, even me included, you know, didn't understand how important preschool was, right? So it's not just a low socioeconomic thing, it's that we as a country don't fully understand what is necessary. The, getting kids reading by third grade is a much higher bar than it was when we were growing up. Nine out of 10 jobs today need high levels of literacy. It was two out of 10 when we were growing up. You know, what's, what's three words of what we're doing? We're unlocking more brains. And it starts at birth, right? We look at China today, and China um, has got a value system um, which is really kind of scary. And while America is maybe not what we want it to be, our, our ideals are there, our values are better, and if we don't unlock more brains, they're almost five times our size. We have to unlock more brains for us to you know, bring our values into the world and to get our values um, to where they meet what, what, um, what we dream them to be. So anyway, I, in this 10 years, while it started out very personally, there's nothing more important, I think, for the future of America than to figure this out. Out. I'm so proud to be a part of this community, which is a model. We are a literacy capital. While we're not at 90%, we are looked at and people visit us here. The superintendent we have, we want to keep. You know, we can point to all the things that don't work, or we can point to the vision and pull people with us up to turn breakdowns into breakthroughs. As Heidi said, that's what this group has always been about. You know, and that's uh, a learning community that can pull up in positive and productive ways is going to is what our kids need. And um, you know, I do think educators are in a really tough spot right now. We don't value them. Wanda Lincoln said that um, she was a preschool educator, she was a principal, she was a college professor, and she was an international consultant. And Wanda runs Quail Valley Charities and you know lives on the Barrier Island. And when she's at a cocktail party and she says, I was a preschool teacher. How do you think people received that? <laughs> Isn't that nice? And then suddenly she says, I was a university professor. And they're like, oh. And she says, look, you know, it's so much harder to teach the four-year-olds, 18 kids running around, than it is, it is college kids. We have it backwards. So part of what I see the, the new governmental leaders and the business leaders are not in this room because 9 to 11 isn't a great time for them. We need to have a, a cocktail party that does some shortened version of this for the business community. And you guys can invite people who you think we should bring to that cocktail party. Like, I see that happening in the next month. Um, but what would it look like for our educators if they actually saw a community where the governmental officials and the businesses are saying, we want the best educators here, where they build affordable housing because as much as David has you know, gotten us competitive financially, educators don't make a lot of money. Um, so how do we get jobs for their spouses? You know, what does it take to attract world-class educators? Um, we can have the best educational system and the best leadership and the best community, and we might not be able to get the talent we need if they can't afford to live here or get a job for their spouse. We're literally competing against other communities. Do you want to live in Indian River County? That's not a recruiter's job at the school district. That's all of our job. And government leaders can step in and play a huge role here. So 2025, people are flocking here as educators because businesses have given them a card of discounts at all their businesses. Businesses are giving parents time to go off and um, give uh, talk to their teachers in their conference. You know. Uh, and, and every parent, you know, hears it from the businesses, from their churches, from places they already go, from the Walmart, that their job is to get kids into quality learning environments and, and read to their kids. So anyway, um, this is just the start. Um, Marie, thank you for organizing all this. Um, MCAN leaders, um, thank you for sharing your stories and being table facilitators. Debbie, thank you for bringing your theatrical elegance to all of our professional development. Um, if there are any questions, please, as many events as we can host and get hosts for, we want you to leave today saying, Marie, I'm willing to. I need some help and support, but I'm willing to bring the message out broadly. Thank you.